Okay, so today is the last lecture for the first module on gene, gene expression. <clears throat> we still have some unfinished topic to cover about single cell RNA seq. Um, so, in the let, let's do a very quick recap of uh, single cell RNA seq. So, the most popular approach um, one is the smart smart base, which is one cell at a time making different sequencing libraries, and the other is the droplet base technologies, which you run the single cells through the droplet, and then you can prepare RNA seq sequencing libraries in each what in some sense um, each RNA is labeled in each droplet with to, to carry a cell barcode, and then you put them together for sequencing, but then use the barcode you will know which transcripts are coming from. Um, in terms of after getting the data, you can either use Cell Ranger or uh, Star Solo to map the reads <coughs> and then quality control, the quality control the cells by removing uh, cells that have too few genes or genes that are expressing too few cells. An important thing about droplet-based single cell RNA-seq is to collapse the UMI for the same uh, gene. As if you have the same UMI for the same gene in the same cell, then they, they, they should just be considered as once rather than adding them up. Um, and then after the, uh, the reads are mapped to the genome, we get the gene level expression for each, uh, each cell. We have this big expression matrix. We need to do re uh, dimension reduction to reduce the total dimension from thousands of cells and uh, tens of thousands of genes into each cell being represented by 20 or 50 or 100 different principal components. And then using the reduced dimensionality, we can do clustering of the cells. And usually we use this graph-based modularity optimization approach to find clusters of cells that are really close to each other. And then we can use either TSNI or UMAP to visualize those different clusters. Um, and then use gene markers to annotate and visualize those different uh, cell clusters. Um, and finally, detect the differential genes. This could be um, for the different clusters within the same sample, or you can compare different uh, samples if they are projected together. And so one thing you might notice is the presence of batch effect. Usually within the same sample, you do a uh, single cell there shouldn't be any batch effect. They all went through the same process, same uh, droplet approach and, and, um, and uh, sequencing. So you can compare the same sample, different clusters for differential expression. But if you were to do a single cell RNA-seq of one patient sample and another patient sample through different assays, then we do have to compare, uh, to consider batch effect. For example, uh, this is one example uh, red is from one original sample and blue is from a different sample. You can see they are kind of together, but they are not completely overlapped, right? So there needs to be some uh, single cell uh, a batch effect removal approaches so that, for example, in this case, after the batch effect removal, you can really see the cells now uh, are hopefully now is clustered by the different cell types and the two different individual samples are now um, really overlapping with each other. There has been many different batch effect removal paper, uh, algorithms developed. In fact, there is a Nature Review Genetics paper uh, summarizing all of those probably 50 different tools. And so the most popular solution is usually dictated by speed because um, a lot of the method that are proposed, if it's not so easy to use, they're not fast enough, then people don't quite use it. Um, what is a quite effective and also pretty fast, um, you, you could try com combat, but the, the co popular one is called canonical correlation analysis. Um, so supposedly each cell you can imagine um, uh, has uh, expression of uh, gene one, gene two, gene three, and, and so on, many different genes. Um, and then another, this is, U1 is from one, oh, sorry, this is from one sample, this is from another sample. Um, you, so basically this uh, canonical correlation analysis is to try to give each gene a linear combination of, so give it a coefficient on each gene so that um, you can kind of like a 
re dimension reduction, but also make sure that the two samples have the best uh, possible correlation. So this is uh, would work well on a case like this because the two uh, the two samples have mostly similar overall uh, distribution. You know, you have roughly similar number of different clusters and each cluster roughly the distributions are more or less comparable for example if you were to uh, look at same uh, breast cancer tissues they all have the cancer cells they have some epithelial normal cells they also have um, different immune cells blood vessels and so on you could use something like cca and so basically um, initially you might have two different data sets that you can see roughly they, they have similarities, but they just don't overlap with each other. And so how can we project each original gene to a new dimension? It's like a similar to a PCA, right? You, you, you project each gene to a different uh, dimension now here, each, each cell to a different dimension so that the different cells in the different samples will have the best overlay of each other. And that's kind of similarly displayed in here. And, um, this method works very well. It is also implemented in the SURAT package that you will be using in homework three. And so after you have uh, the batch effect removal, then you could really uh, compare the different samples. So, uh, so this is displaying the figure in TSNI, but you can also imagine displaying the final result in UMAP. Then you could compare the two different samples to see whether there is any uh, differences. And so if you want to compare the differential expression, make sure that you have batch effect removal first between the different samples before you use MAST or uh, uh, man whitney u test to look at the differential expression for the same cell type in the different clusters. Um, so in terms of batch effect removal, we need to be careful with one thing. Um, so we need to check uh, whether there is the need to do batch effect removal because sometimes you could overcorrect um, so this is one study where uh, people have profiled a different, uh, different tumors. If you look at the cancer cells, this is only uh, looking at the cancer cells, you can see um, each of this MEEI is one patient. And if you draw this t plot on the cancer cells, you would think, oh, there is clearly a batch effect because this patient, all the cancer cells are here. This patient, all the cancer cells are there. They are clearly clustered by the, the cancer type or the, the patient, uh, individual patients. And so you would think that you need to do the batch effect removal. Interestingly, if you were to look at those non-malignant cells, so uh, in this case, if you look at all the immune cells, interestingly, these patients actually clustered pretty well by the uh, cell type. All the macrophage cells from all these patients are clustered together. All the endothelial cells from different patients cluster together, fibroblasts together, T cells together. So in this case, uh, it, this has been repeatedly observed now. Very often, even for the same cancer type, if you were to cluster their immune cells, they do, uh, they could actually cluster well, but if you look at their cancer cells, it seems that every patient looks still quite different um, because of their mutations, because of the different regulation programs. Very often we do see the cancer cells cluster by patient. And uh, but if we look at the immune cells, we would know that this data is already pretty well harmonized. You probably don't need to do additional batch effect removal anymore, okay? Um, and so um, in order, so because of this potential batch effect uh, issue, ideally, if you have multiple tumors, you want to profile all of them through the same droplet uh, process together. If that is doable, you can potentially reduce the batch effect. And so um, another experimental technique is developed, it's called SiteSeq. This is developed at the New York Genome Center. Um, so the idea is uh, if, if you have an antibody, so initially the method was not really developed to, to do multiplex, multiple samples. It is to concurrently measure um, both the cell surface proteins at a single cell, as well as the 
RNA uh, expression at a single cell resolution. So supposedly, if we are interested in certain cell surface protein, it could be that this cell surface protein, the RNA expression for the cell is not as high. And so if you do single cell RNA-seq, the RNA might be a dropout in the cell. You wouldn't observe the expression of the RNA as well. But if uh, the protein is on the cell surface, what you can do is if you, the, the protein you are interested in, you can have an antibody against a cell surface protein. Then uh, this, this antibody, so you have to buy this reagent separately or make it yourself to tag this uh, antibody to a PCR handle and then uh, antibody barcode followed by poly A. So this is kind of interesting. You can see here, um, you can put in multiple cell surface proteins, each with its own was a, multiple antibodies against different cell surface proteins. So in this case, um, in this, supposedly we have a big uh, tumor sample. We can generate the single cell, they're all floating now. And then if we're interested in this case, three different cell surface proteins, we can use three different antibodies. And this antibody has a PCR handle and it has an antibody barcode. It denotes that this is the blue antibody. And this one is the yellow antibody. And based on the barcode, you know this one is the kind of the red antibody. And each of them at the end, you can see there's a poly A tail towards the end. And so, um, these antibodies will be attached to the cell surface. And so the, the cell surface, if it has the protein expression um, for the antibody you are interested in, the antibody will be attached to the cell. And then um, you can wash the cells off. And so put this antibody attached the cells through this droplet machine. And so at the end, each of these droplets will not only contain the, you know, this, this uh, reagent, the bead, which contain the cell, uh, cell barcode, but also um, the single cell as well as the antibody that's attached to it. And then um, when you make the um, sequencing, or, 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 or attach the transcript to the cell barcode, you can see here because each of this site-seq antibody is attached to a barcode at the end that also have a, a poly A, it will be considered by this droplet as just another transcript so because all the regular RNA will have a poly A and this antibody sequence at the end also have poly A. So this sequence will also be attached to the, the bead. And so uh, when you use the poly T uh, to create uh, the reverse tra transcript, uh, transcriptase, you will create the cDNA and then it will also be sequenced out at the end. And so what happens is that if you look at all the transcripts in this cell, not only you will have the cell barcode attaching to all the transcripts with this cell, but also this particular red antibodies uh, barcode as well, because the red antibody has its own barcode and it also have the same cell barcode that will also be sequenced out. So at the end, you will know that um, this cell um, has a, a cell surface expression of a certain protein, which is bound by your red antibody. And so you could use it to really potentially enrich for some cells that have cell surface protein expression. But this approach uh, nowadays can also be used to multiplex multiple samples into one run. So supposedly you have one tumor, uh, you can just put in some general antibody that binds to all the cells anyways. And so if one sample, you use this and you have a one barcode, which labels all the sample with one barcode, and another sample is a different barcode, a third sample is a different barcode, and then you can mix all the single cell suspensions together. Then, so basically you can imagine uh, if yellow is one tumor sample, blue is another tumor sample, and, ye and red is another tumor sample, you can use the antibody to attach to the cell to decide which, what to first label which sample it's coming from. Then you can mix all the cells and let them go through the droplet machine and then make single cell sequencing libraries. At the end, all of these uh, uh, sequences, you can sequence them out, out and then based on the, this antibody barcode, you will know whether it's coming from the first tumor or the second tumor or the third tumor. And with this approach, 
you might be able to analyze the data without doing any batch effect because they are all processed together. You will drastically reduce your batch effect. Okay, so you can see um, nowadays when people are doing a single cell protein experiment, because basically the, the, the original site seek is to concurrently measure both the cell surface protein expression through this barcoded antibody, as well as the single cell RNA expression level. So in some sense, some of the current uh, single cell proteomics experiment through a uh, barcoded antibody is becoming a DNA-based assay, right? So which is really, really powerful. And so there are, of, of course, a lot more single cell RNA-seq applications. And this is a review in 2016, and this field is really moving very quickly, right? So for example, you can look at how the cell state transition. This is really specifically looking at cell cycle genes. This is to look at the spatial position. So supposedly you have um, a brain tissue. You want to look at single cell expression at the spatial resolution. Um, it's possible that next year the commercial kit will also be available. Well, actually, there, there is a commercial kit that just became available from 10X as well. Maybe next year we'll, we'll be adding a module for spatial transcriptomics as well. Um, you can use single cell to look at the discrete cell types. This is usually, for example, in the blood, there are different immune cell types, or in the tumor, there are you know, different immune cell types in there. You can also look at continuous phenotype. This is usually uh, for differentiation and the cell is drifting from one state to a different state. At the same time, you, you can also looking at the temporal progression with time, what happens, and see that this is also a, another differentiation process. Yeah, so this is the stimulation, but yeah, you can also use it to look at the differentiation, so to look at the trajectories. And so a lot of new applications are developed, and also there are, uh, recently I, I heard a blog uh, or a Twitter, it mentions that there, uh, this is a talk from Leo Pactor's group. He mentioned uh, that the, the rate of single cell data increase is proportional to the rate of single cell tools that are being developed in this area, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, there's a question? Yeah, so you said you can use um, different barcodes from all the different genome samples, mm -hmm. but then don't all the other cell types, like when you use regular single cell sequencing from them, they also have different barcodes? Can we distinguish uh, which barcodes to each of them? Okay, so uh, the question is how do you uh, use site seeks to distinguish the different cell types from the different uh, okay, different cell type um, so uh, so basically, if you just use this site seek antibody in this case you you don't try to uh, so, so if you only use this as a multiplexing approach, then you don't use the antibodies against the specific cell surface marker. And so basically, uh, you are just trying to label, so that antibody will be recognizing all the cells for, for this sample. And, and it will be very, very general antibody sequence. And then another uh, barcode. So basically, in that case, the antibody will be the same, but just different samples have a different barcode. And so this way, um, you use the, the antibody to attach to all the cells in one sample. Another antibody, well, it's, a it's the same antibody, but attached to a different barcode to attach to all the cells in the second sample. And then you use the same antibody with a third different barcode to attach to the third sample. And then, because each of them is already a single cell, now you can merge all of the single cells together, right? And then you go through this droplet, and each droplet, well, they, they will treat all of the samples as just a big bunch of single cells. And then after you sequence everything based on the, the barcode, because all the samples, uh, all the cells that belong to the first sample will contain this red antibody barcode then you will know that's coming from the first sample. Uh, yes, another question? So you said you're using the same antibody with different barcodes. Uh, doesn't that basically bias what you're looking for on the cell surface? Uh, so, um, 
So this, the question is, if you use the same antibody, whether that will have a bias. So in some sense, the site seek to really look at protein cell surface expression is a different purpose of using site seek. If you really want to use site seek to look at cell surface proteins, you probably don't go through this multiplex approach. So, so in this case, it will be, so if you use this to really look at single cell, cell surface protein expression, then yes, the one antibody will be labeling all the T cells. Another antibody will be labeling all the B cells. Another antibody labeling all the dendritic cells or, or you know, whatever marker you're interested in. But if you wanna use it for kind of a multiplex approach, then basically you just, you, you, it, you, you don't really use a, well, it has to be some kind of a cell surface antibody, but then this antibody will label all of the cells in that sample. Okay, that's the thing. All right. Um, uh, by the way, unless people really want to have a bias, they say, um, I want to look at only the T cells in all of the different patient samples, then you can have a CD3 antibody, which will have all the T cells. You use this on the first sample and you sort all of the T cells out. And then you use a different barcode, also the CD3, and so you are collecting all the T cells from each sample, then you sequence them together. Okay, so this basically allow you to look at more samples um, at a time and you can maybe process them in different batches. Then at least the, the batch to batch will be well, so, so so very often in this case, you can overload your sample your, your cell a little bit. Remember, 10x genomic can deal with 10,000 cell at a time. And so, if you have say four samples, you you can try to put merge the four samples together, let them go through the machine, and hopefully you will end up having really 10,000 good quality samples to work with in this case. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically, um, the, as I mentioned, the tools for single cell analysis has also been increasing a lot. And um, an interesting phenomenon that we see is that in the old days, when people are developing bioinformatics tools, they just develop one function to answer one per specific purpose. But with single cell, because the analysis is really complex, we now see these very comprehensive computational pipelines that provides the full solution of single cell analysis. And um, uh, once they, are, they become popular, more and more other tools, when they are published, these two, two developers will start to evaluate the tool. And if they like it, they will incorporate those new tools into their pipelines. And so um, the three pipelines that we can introduce to uh, students in this course, um, the first one is called SCDE, and recently it's made into a, a pip pipeline called Pagoda. This is a uh, point and click, this is really for biologists who does not do any coding. And it's a, you know, like a Java interface, there's no coding needed, you just point and click, and it will man man maneuver the cells around and calculate differential expression. We also have a lot of very nice uh, functions there. Um, in this course uh, for homework three, we are gonna uh, show you the SURAT, uh, to a pipeline, which is a R pipeline for single cell analysis. And they also incorporated a lot of good practices. Um, for example, uh, when the master tool was published by a different group, Surat incorporated this into the pipeline so that you can call a master directly in Surat. And so this is R function. Unfortunately, R has some limitations. When you have too many cells, like if you have single cell sample from uh, single cell data from 50 tumors, then it's not the, necessarily the SURAT limitation, it's the R limitation. The memory usage efficiency is not as good. And so um, one other tool which is really gaining popularity, you can see it's published in 2018. I just checked, it's cited over 200 times now. It's called SCANPI. This is a, a Python version of single cell analysis. Also, uh, most of the tools in SURAT and SCANPI they have similar functions to do, you know, normalization, uh, dimension reduction, clustering, differential expression, batch effect removal, but it, it doesn't have as much of the um, memory or efficiency issues. Um, so yeah, so it, it is possible that next year we'll also potentially move to ScanPy for homework three. Um, yeah, so you can see here, uh, single cell RNA-seq, the technology 
and also the algorithm development are both moving really, really fast. Um, it could be that next year we'll have even more topics on single cell technology and also a different tool for single cell analysis. And uh, it is getting cheaper and more robust. In the early days, a lot of these single cell studies, they were just developing technology. They're not really processing multi, like complex tissues to look at the biology. They just want to see, does this new technology even work? But now, um, because of commercial solutions, I think academic improvement also help companies to make better and better reagents and their kit and uh, machines to do this single cell analysis. And because of these commercial solutions, it's a quite turnkey system. A lot of labs now can just uh, use a core facility, get your samples into single cell, then sort through the, the, the droplet-based uh, approach, then get the result and send them for sequencing. And because of this, um, people are processing samples with a much better biological purpose. In the early days, it was more technical purpose. Now we are looking at um, patients who are treated with some drugs or looking at the differentiation or looking at the the, the real biological questions, there will be more and the more data generated. Um, it's, the, the data increase is really phenomenal. In fact, well, the, the, the developer for this Pagoda tool said that right now they are only interested in collecting single cell data and looking at the expression from single cell clusters because that data increase can potentially very quickly overtake the whole publicly available um, microarray data for RNA expression or even bulk RNA-seq, uh, which is really great for data reuse and also calls for, for, for biologists to really learn computational biology because there's just so much insight. If you don't know how to even do single cell analysis, you'll miss a lot of potential discovery opportunities. And I hope you can see from SiteSeq Single cell RNA-seq can now be combined with single cell proteomics. Um, in the second module, we will also tell you single cell RNA-seq can be a, a combined with attack-seq and uh, also CRISPR screens. So the technology is really moving very fast and very, very exciting. Um, so uh, I, I think because of these commercial solutions now, more among groups are, are using this technique on their regular experiments, especially in real mouse, human, or the tissues, you know, whereas early days in bulk, a lot of people do experiment just on cell lines. So questions? <laughs>